Good evening, and thank you for joining us as we get ready to broadcast the fourth and final debate in the race for Seattle City Council. I'm Brian Jackson. Tonight's debate topics will cover wide-ranging topics from gun violence to policing, homelessness, and affordable housing. And there are two candidates vying for the District 5 Council seat that will be vacated by Council Member Deborah Juarez. The candidates are Christiana O.B. Sumner and Kathy Moore. Christiana is the CEO of a social equity consulting firm and co-chair the Seattle Disability Rights Commission. They were motivated to run by the housing affordability crisis in Seattle. Kathy is a retired King County Superior Court judge, started her career as a public defender, and also chaired the Seattle Human Rights Commission. She says she was motivated to run over public safety concerns. District 5 covers Greenwood, Northgate, Lake City, Pinehurst, and Bitter Lake. Don't forget, if you miss any of these debates, you can find them on the Fox Local Connected TV app. And now, here are the moderators for the District 5's debate tonight, including Fox 13's John Hopperstad. And from the Roy Flores Wellness Center at North Seattle College, good evening and welcome and thanks for being with us tonight. I'm John Opperset from Fox 13 coming to you live for the District 5 Seattle City Council debate. And I'm Jake Wittenberg with King 5. And good evening. I'm Angela King with KUOW 94.9 FM Seattle. This debate is brought to you by Seattle City Club. Our City Club is dedicated to improving the civic health of our region by fostering a dialogue and providing access to our higher leaders, our highest leaders, I should say. And a big thanks going out this evening to our sponsors for making tonight possible. Comcast, GSBA, Puget Sound Energy, the Henry M. Jackson Foundation, and the Seattle Colleges, our host. Also, thanks to our media partners and our production partner as well, PNTA. And, of course, thank you to our live audience here at North Seattle College. Our lovely audience has agreed to continue the evening without comment. No booze, no cheers. We'll hold that until the end. But you can join the conversation online. Join us live on whichever social media platform you prefer, we ask that you use the hashtag C-E-L-E-X, S-E-A-E-L-E-X. Now let's meet our candidates tonight, Christiana Obi Sumner, Sumner and Kathy Moore. You can applaud on this one. <laughs> Get it all out of your system tonight. And here is the format for tonight's debate. Each candidate is going to have 90 seconds for an opening statement. Candidates will then have one minute to respond to initial questions. Our panel will then lead a follow-up discussion on that topic before moving on. So let's get started here. We flipped a coin before the debate begins. Kathy Moore will have the first opening statement. Kathy. Great. Thank you very much for having me here this evening. Uh, my name is Kathy Moore, and I'm running for Seattle City Council in District 5. Um, I've lived in Seattle most of my life. Uh, my mother and I moved here when I was four. Uh, my husband and I have raised three children here and um, also started a small business. Um, I've started my uh, career as a public defender working in the criminal legal system, the behavioral health system, the child welfare system. I also served as a King County Superior Court judge where I continued to work in those systems. I also served as the interim Seattle City Clerk, where I managed a budget of $3 million and 30-plus employees, and also uh, reported to all nine council members and was intimately involved in passing legislation during that. I got into this race because I care very deeply about the city, and I feel that we need to have um, good governance, we need to have sound leadership, and we need to have a council that's willing to collaborate with our mayor and with one another. I have been endorsed by Mayor Harrell. Uh, by Dow Constantine, by the firefighters, a number of uh, entities out there who have all worked with me in the past and know that I am somebody that can get things done and will work cooperatively with them. And I look forward to answering your questions tonight. Thank you. And Christiana? I came to Seattle in 2010 when I got a scholarship to Seattle University. This is the seventh state I've lived in, but I've been civically engaged my entire life. I started my career here as a direct social service worker where I saw that the systems and the policies were what was creating barriers for my clients. As co-chair of Seattle Disabilities Commission, I worked to pass or help pass one of the nation's first bans on subminimum wage, which led me to continue that work uh, to Harborview where I worked at this admin coordinated entry. And from there, starting my own small business, 
where we've worked with over 250 businesses, governments, and organizations across the country, where I continue to see that it's policy and structures that is the uh, biggest barrier for progress and change. But I have a track record of success with those 250 businesses, and I believe I can bring that to city council as well. I would love to come and uh, speak to policies that is taking both all of the knowledge of that, uh, of, of, the, of the policy process, the policy strategy, and bringing the grounded experience and reality of, the, the, of people here in Seattle, in District 5, of folks who are renters, of folks who are disabled like myself. I have also been endorsed by uh, Senator Noel Frame, Senator Rebecca Saldana, uh, Representative Faravar, um, Planned Parenthood, uh, the 36 and 46, and County Democrats. And I look forward to talking to you today. Okay, thank you very much, both of you. And let's get to our first question here. And it's kind of an all-around question about Seattle. We love living in Seattle. There's a lot of great things to love about the city. But right now, there are things to be concerned about as well. We have open-air drug markets. We have home invasions, unaffordable rents for many. So my question to you, is Seattle in crisis? And what would be your first proposal as a city councilor to make the city and District 5 a better place to live? Christiana, we'll go first with you. To be completely honest, after 2020, our nation is in crisis. Our world is in crisis. I think that there's a lot going on in our district that we actually can address and perhaps even be a model towards how we can um, perhaps move forward as humans. I mean, in the state where we have climate uh, disaster, where we have an economic crisis, um, we have so many different sort of things that we need to address. What I think is really important here at Seattle, and, and is why I am so passionate about running for office and have been asked to run for office, is that we really do need to make sure that we have policy solutions and investments that's going to get to the tap root of the issue. That's going to have multiple pathways towards shared goals where everyone can come into coalition and community and find that solution. And that we can actually achieve those goals in a way that is going to be sustainable, effective, and um, be able to perhaps bring a little bit of hope back to our city. Is there a policy, though, or a proposal that you would want to introduce on day one as a city council member that you think would make the lives of people better? I would love to start in-house, of course, consultant, right? And so I would love to work with uh, Councilmember Tammy Morales' office to continue working towards making the Race and Social Justice Initiative an ordinance. I also want to make sure that the tree ordinance is paused so, so we can actually work towards a Green New Deal and that I'm able to uh, see what's going on with the social housing PDA and what the funding is going to look for, like for that because I think that's going to help with a lot of the root causes we have. Okay. Kathy, the same question to you. Is Seattle in crisis and what would you do on day one to make it a better place? Uh, yes, I do think Seattle's in crisis. Um, I think we've been in crisis for a period of time, and I think you see that that's part of the reason that there's such high turnover at the council and so many people that are running. Um, I think the public has been very clear about what the priorities are. They've told us their priorities from day one are public safety, dealing with homelessness, uh, housing affordability, and also climate. So the very first thing that I would do uh, if, uh, if elected to council is um, continue to work with our police department to figure out how, in fact, we can recruit more officers. We have the money there, um, but unfortunately, our recruitment efforts have not been terribly effective. And so I think we need to be reaching out to the SPD and, and asking them, what can we do to get more officers? Because that's the first step towards moving towards, towards public safety. Um, the other thing that we need to do is make sure that our a third public safety department, the Alternative Civilian Responder Program, is also robust. We don't actually have enough behavioral health workers. We don't have enough social workers. It's a pipeline issue. So also reaching out to them and finding out ways okay. that the city that's council time. can uh, support them. Another issue that's a big concern for a lot of folks in this room as well, gun violence in Seattle at an all-time high last year. In fact, homicide numbers are the highest we've seen in 30 years in the city of Seattle. So we want to get into public safety here, and Jake has more on that. Sure. Thank you, John. You know, a lot of the violent crime we've seen are among juveniles, teenagers in District 5. It was almost one year ago at Ingram High School when a 17-year-old boy was murdered by a 14-year-old boy here in the district. The state lawmakers have floated the idea of a potential task force to try to get to the bottom of this. Kathy, we'll start with you on this question. Would that be enough, and what would you do to commit 
to protecting kids and preventing more youth crime? Yes, um, I do think we absolutely need to have a state task force. Gun violence is uh, epidemic across our nation, and not just our city, but we also really seeing an uptick in our city. Um, I think the, the absolute most important thing that we need to do is to invest in the mental health of our youth. A lot of what happened at Ingram really was really because of people not having sufficient support services, not having sufficient access to mental health. We know that our youth, since the COVID, are absolutely struggling. Uh, Council uh, President Juarez was one of the people to move uh, much more funding forward, but we, we still don't have enough funding. We also need to be looking at how do we deal with illegal, we need to increase our police uh, staff so that they can get illegal guns off the street. We need to do a better job of keeping track of illegal guns. Also, when I served as a King County Superior Court judge, one of the things I did was enter extreme risk protection orders where we were able to take guns away from people who were in behavioral health crisis. You're a former prosecutor. A quick follow-up for you. Would you support prosecuting parents in relation to these youth crimes? Um, actually, I was a former public defender. Um, so would I support prosecuting parents? Um, I, I think it would depend on the circumstance. I know we had a parent prosecuted in the past. I tend to think it's better to be proactive and look at ways that we can educate parents. We need to provide uh, gun locks, gun safes. That's something that the council can do. We can work with every town for safety. Uh, gun, um, the gun Alliance and Moms Demand Action for more education. And thank you for the correction there. I appreciate that I misspoke. Uh, Christiana, and your thoughts on youth crime and what you would do on day one. Yeah, uh, one of the things that is really interesting, people may have heard that I've been looking to Camden, New Jersey as a model for how we can both increase community safety and increase alternative community um, supports. So uh, definitely for community violence intervention programs, I think it's really important for a couple of reasons. Number one, what we know for whatever reason it is, youth are perhaps going to have a different opinion or way that they show up if a police officer comes to them, but they might actually uh, take the treatment or the intervention if it's someone else that uh, seems more like uh, a community member, so, so to speak. Uh, growing up in Camden County, New Jersey, I also know that youth go into crime and gangs when they have a, uh, an environment where they are low income. Uh, they have uh, economic issues, they have housing instability, and so we really do need to make sure that we're addressing those root causes so that we can have at least that stability for our youth and maybe that can help. But you mentioned it is a, it is a potential gang issue, yet yeah, yeah. partially the gang unit more, needs more officers. You've been opposed to increasing the number of officers. Wouldn't that have an impact on the ability to prevent youth crime? Well, the thing about with the Canada, New Jersey model is when they, they, they sort of rebuilt the police department from scratch and made them county workers as opposed to, an, a, to a form of police department, which did lead to an increase of officers and the officers was having a different approach. It was more community policing that would be able to really get to the heart of the issue as opposed to feeling punitive. It felt more uh, uh, familial. And so I think that, you know, we need to really look at not just sort of how do we address the issue, but the, the humans at the center of it and what's going to lead to that. We are talking about earlier the police, uh, the need for more police, and, and uh, the mayor has proposed 1,400 police officers, and I believe, Kathy, you support that. But, Christiana, you, you do not. Can you explain what you would like to see happen instead of that, and does that make Seattle streets safer by not having as many police officers on the force? Yeah, I mean, the, if you read the Police Enforcement uh, Research Foundation's report across from 2016 to 2020, or 2023 now, um, you'll see that they say that the recruitment issue has been an, it, going on for almost a decade now. And a lot of the th interventions that we have are not working. I do feel like we need to make sure that our police are available for those priority one calls and then see if we could take that bandwidth off of them with these alternative services so that we can have it both and. Kathy? Uh, no, it doesn't make our streets safer. We need more police. Um, you know, the, yes, our police are stressed. They're having a difficult time, but they've been very clear with us about what they need. And the number one request that we've had from the police is give us more staff. So we're not having to pull detectives off the, uh, 
their jobs being detectives. We're not having to take people out of the gun, uh, gun violence prevention unit. So I think we need to listen to the police when they tell us exactly what it is they need. Uh, I'd like to ask a question in regards to public safety before we move on to a new topic, and that includes response times. Uh, the north portion of Seattle has some of the longest police response times. District 5, if you have a nonviolent crime, you may not see an officer until tomorrow. Uh, Christiana, we'll start with you to pick this up on this topic. What is it you can do to help with response times, given what you said about the police recruiting issue? Yeah, so what, I, what we also have seen in the, in the empirical research right now is that um, having more police officers but continuing to put additional purview on top of their bandwidth is not going to reduce those response times. So if we need priority one response, um, let's have that. But some studies have shown here in Seattle that 40 to 60 percent of calls doesn't have to be responded to for police. So we can alleviate that burden. We can actually perhaps have a more, um, you know, a more uh, quicker response. Kathy. Um, again, my, uh, Christiane and I disagree here. Um, my position is that even if we have the alternative civilian responders, and we absolutely do need to have them, that doesn't uh, give, a, create enough bandwidth for our officers to continue to deal with the priority one crimes. That's not going to make that go away. The only thing that's going to help with that is getting more actual police officers who can deal with crime in progress. Uh, we can also look at uh, utilizing community service officers as another alternative. All right, we want to kind of move to a similar topic here, police accountability, and Angela's got more on that. Despite offering hiring bonuses, and Kathy, this is something you mentioned, the SPD is still dealing with staffing shortages. And you could argue that's because other cities are offering better wages, but some say the Seattle City Council is to blame for the current tension that is causing the potential candidates to look elsewhere for jobs in policing. So, and if you really consider what happened in light of what happened to the previous police department chief, Carmen Best, back in 2020, there was a very fraught relationship between the leadership and the council. So do you agree that the city council is partially responsible for what's going on when it comes to staffing at the SPD? Kathy, I begin with you. Uh, yes, I do actually uh, agree that the city council is partially responsible for that. Um, I think that uh, during the defund movement um, that many people in the uh, police department felt um, unsupported uh, and decided to move on. And I don't think that we have reached a point where we have come to, um, come to trust one another, come to see one another as being in partnership. Now, part of that means that we need to do a better job of creating a robust accountability structure um, because we cannot really ask the council to change the dial on the dialogue until we know that we are going to have police officers who are professional, and if they are not professional or they're engaged in unconstitutional policing, that there is going to be, uh, they are going to be held accountable of, and, and very much aware of that fact. So we need to be able to shift the dialogue, but we need to have some pieces in place before we can do that effectively. Christiana, same question to you. Certainly. Is the Seattle City Council partially to blame for what we're seeing right now when it comes to concerns surrounding the SPD, specifically around staffing? Yeah, so again, referring to the Police Enforcement Research Foundation's um, sort of uh, biannual reports, they said that this is actually an issue across the country. Across the country, the, the um, bonuses do not work. Across the country, folks have felt slighted, starting with Ferguson, Missouri. Um, sure, there could, there's, there's definitely some, some tension going on, there's definitely some fighting. But I do think that what's important is to uh, look at the longitudinal data across the country. But also, I would say the number one thing I've heard from constituents that they're really looking for is a city council who's willing to actually focus on the goals and not get stuck in sort of minutia or fighting that um, sort of gets folks off that plan. And that's also going to go for police and other departments as well to move towards those shared goals. So a follow-up question on that front. How would you steer clear of the minutia? Well, like I said, um, a social equity consultant, right? And I've had to work 40 hours a week, even through this campaign as a working class person. It's literally what I do um, in organizational development, and I've done it successfully. Um, it's what people 
hire me to do. Um, and so when I go into city council, I'm, I'm looking to see if the toolkit of success I've used and other organizations and municipalities would work in Seattle, especially since it's my home. I believe that I'm confident that I can do so. I'll hand it back over to John. Uh, one of the controversies around police accountability, as you know, is that footage that recently came out, that body camera footage of a Seattle police officer leader, an officer's guild leader, laughing and joking in the wake of a fatal officer-involved collision. We had another Seattle police officer under fire, this time for alleged racist comments he made off-duty. Now, I've actually got a question from the audience based on that. The two officers involved in that phone call on that video were Seattle Police Guild President Mike Solon and Vice President Daniel Otterer. In light of that video, should the city be negotiating the next police contract with them? Kathy, we'll ask you first. Um, well, excuse me. Um, I think that's a very difficult question because they are a union. They have the right as a union to choose their leadership. The membership has chosen their leadership. Um, what I think the council does need to look at, though, is that the union president is on the city budget. The, with city council pays part of the salary of the president. And I do not think that that is appropriate. Uh, that's the only union in which the city pays for uh, their salary. So particularly uh, in light of what has happened and the ongoing um, controversies that we are having, I, I think that that's a place that we should uh, begin to look. Okay. Christiana? Like most of you grew up in a society where the police were supposed to be the good guys with the badge you know I had dare in my school when we had that and when I think about police I think about people who respect everyone and don't see someone whatever their age is to be literally 10% of the area medium wage here in Seattle any organization any department any professional space needs to have accountability and I believe that if we do not hold police accountable to fulfilling their civic duty of protecting and respecting us I think that there needs to be recourse for that John I can yeah I'd ask a follow-up for that if I can uh, would you vote for a police contract that does not include additional accountability measures in it Absolutely not. I think that what's, whether we had 2020 happen or not, I think what, what's, what we have here to show, even before 2020, is that there is something going on with the Seattle Police Department in terms of their, uh, whether it's culture, whether it's temperament, whatever that is. I would really love to see if we could work with them to, um, in the ways that they did in County, New Jersey, see if they can actually build trust and rapport with the community. But there's going to have to be some work. And until then, we need to put those measures in place. Thank you, Kathy. I'd like to ask you the same question. Would you at any point support a new police contract without this measure of accountability in it? Oh, absolutely not. That is the, uh, the bottom line. We have to have the accountability uh, provisions in place. In fact, the council in 2017 passed a very robust accountability uh, ordinance. Unfortunately, it was bargained away. Those provisions are now in the SPMA contract. I don't see any reason why they shouldn't be in the patrol contract. Additionally, my, in answer to your question, and the last question, if we don't negotiate with the current leadership, we're not going to get a contract that has accountability pr uh, provisions in it. Okay, let's turn to the fentanyl crisis because Seattle's facing a grim reality there and District 5 is as well. We are on pace for record drug fatalities in the city as well as King County. So Seattle's fire chief actually says treatment options are lacking right now for folks who are addicted. Would you support the city investing in private treatment? And remember, we're facing about a $200 million deficit in the budget coming up in a couple of years. But would you support investing in private treatment for those who can't afford it? Absolutely. Um, treatment is critical. And um, uh, uh, excuse me, Councilmember Nelson uh, last year, I believe, proposed a pilot program uh, that would have provided uh, tr basically walk-in treatment uh, for free to individuals, and this current council did not pass it. Uh, we have got to get treatment into place. We passed the new drug ordinance, and the, the uh, key provision of that is that people will be diverted into treatment and we have to have that treatment in place to make that law effective. 
There are other types of treatment out there. There's medication assistant treatment. Um, there are lots of clinics in the city that provide that treatment, but we need to work with people who want to be able to get completely clean and sober. We need to invest in that infrastructure. Christiana. You know, as a uh, social service worker, I uh, worked with folks who are literally homeless, um, who got into permanent supportive housing or other sort of means at the hospital. And, um, you know, before fentanyl, it was black tar heroin, right? Before that, it was meth. Um, I've had to literally have clients die from trying to Narcan them and not work. Um, because I spent that time with them, I know that there needs to be treatment and there needs to be treatment similar to with the children where uh, folks where they actually will go to, people are afraid of that clinical setting. They, you know, that's why I say we need overdose prevention centers, but we, if someone's afraid they're gonna get set to the sixth floor, they won't go, but, they would, but I saw so many people go to Food Not Bombs or People Harm Reduction Alliance and get help. And so really at the end of the day, what we need to do is make sure that the people who make these facilities run the workers, the uh, social workers, the therapists, the outreach workers, that they're funded to scale because most of those programs are working on a shoestring budget and people are being paid uh, wages that's not sustainable. But again, we're looking at a budget shortfall in the next couple of years. How would you, this is a question for both of you, how would you pay for this? Well, if we're looking at it from a crisis perspective, I know that um, federally there's, a, you know, depending on what's going to happen federally, we never know with them, right? There's going to be pots of money, whether it's through, you know, the, um, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Foundation, whether it's through um, even some of the housing um, bills, if they have intersectional um, dis uh, disabilities or chronic illnesses, there's funds for that programmatic and service piece of it. And so there are, um, you know, the... Uh, the Coalition to End Homelessness said to increase in the housing for uh, emergency housing, um, the, the, the programmatic space so they can hire more people. Okay. Kathy, how would we pay for this? Uh, well, that's a good question. So one of the things that we do have are the opioid settlement monies from the state. And I want to say, uh, I'm very proud to say that I actually, um, the Pharma Purdue case came before me as a judge. I was the one that upheld the decision that allowed for it to go on and become um, a monumental multi-dollar settlement. So we have state opioid monies. You can also, and we also have federal monies. Um, you know, I think we should look at what King County does. King County has a very small sales tax uh, called the MIDD, and they designate that very small uh, percentage of the sales tax to dealing with mental, uh, behavioral health and uh, substance use treatment. Uh, I think that that's a route that we should also entertain. Okay. And speaking of the state, the city of Seattle, as you, recent, as you know, recently reversed a decision not to criminally charge people for possessing drugs or openly using them, basically adopting the statewide law. So is that fair to the people of Seattle and those struggling with drugs? And if not, what would be your solution? Kathy? Was it fair to pass the law? Is that law fair to, to change it to where you can now criminalize drug use and open drug use? Well, I, I think the city really had no choice but to codify the state law. I don't think that the city should be in a position of deciding which state laws it's going to enforce and not enforce. I think that's a slippery slope. But I also think that we did, the, the legislature thought very carefully about that and decided that that does remain an important tool to use in getting people into treatment and made it very clear that the intent was treatment. So I think it is fair because we're trying to get people well. Okay, Christiana. You know, I, it, it, it just feels a lot like the war on drugs, which we know empirically it was unsuccessful. I do feel that there, that bill could have been written in a different way where it was providing those alternative services and funding things that we know work instead of this. In addition to that, going back to SPD being sort of overburdened, overloaded, it's, it's asking them to do even more by being the people who are assessing folks on the street. So I feel like it's, try, it's overloading a system that's already in, in crisis, and we need to have some uh, transformative and innovative solutions here. Okay, let's move on to homelessness, because that's an issue that's affecting every major U.S. city, and Seattle is certainly no exception. Angela King has more on that topic. Yes, and we'll take a look at the numbers in Seattle specifically here in just a minute. But let's talk about an issue that is facing every community, and District 5 is no exception. Communities uh, specifically like Bitter Lake, 
here in District 5 have dealt with encampments popping up, uh, including one near Broadview, Thompson, K-8. through That was cleared a couple of years ago, um, a lot of controversy surrounding that process and how it was handled. But, Christiana, I ask you first, do you approve of the city's use of encampment sweeps, and do you think specific areas should be set aside for encampments? I believe that we need to increase tiny home villages. If you look at the Count of Sin reports across the years, over 95 percent with variants across the years have said they would take tiny home villages as shelter and they would go there immediately. But as someone who's worked in shelters, folks outside are also afraid of shelters too, right? And so no one, need, no one should be outside, absolutely no one. But the fact of the matter is, when you do the sweep, not only is it traumatic, but it also they just go across the street because the real bottleneck here is that we don't have the shelters and the housing for folks to go. So if we are working double time in a both and, what can we do um, innovatively, whether it's you know with the motel voucher program or other sort of things that we've used in the past to, and while we're um, building these tiny home villages and seeing what happens with the social housing PDA, so we can try to just stop the glut and, and, move, and move that blockage forward. So again, are you against? I am 100% against encampments, yes. I, I don't, I, it's, against I mean, encampments I'll, I'll sweep, or sweeps? The sweeps, okay. I don't, I encampment sweeps. I, I mean, at this point, if, if they need to have folks in a specific area, I would just make sure that it wasn't um, an area that would be that would that that would be ha harmful in other ways to the folks who would be living there because they are also humans too. Yes. We are all a community. Kathy, question to you. Same question. Um, so I do support Mayor Harrell's approach. Um, his their, his administration's approach is to do outreach, to offer services, and to offer shelter. Uh, where I and they have worked very well with the unified care team and they have also uh, through the regional uh, homelessness authority contracted with just cause uh, Which is the PDA group that also does lead and co-lead and they very successfully resolved the encampments at Ballard Commons So I think it is a model that works um, But we have to be very clear that it is not humane um, or safe to have people residing in tents on the sidewalk in, um, in parks and in greenways. And I think that the city needs to be more proactive. So right now to deal with the issue, you have to file so many find it, fix it, and somebody has to be shot or there has to be a fire before anything is done. As soon as a tent shows up, as soon as an RV is there, we get a community service officer out there. We get somebody from Just Cause. We get somebody, a social worker, who can deal with the issues and get somebody into shelter and house. Okay. Kathy, you mentioned the King County Regional Homelessness Authority just now. And according to HUD's annual homelessness assessment in 2022, Seattle King County was third in the nation for having the highest homelessness rate. We were only behind Los Angeles and New York. King County Regional Homelessness Authority was created in 2021 to help fix what was considered a fragmented system. But the agency has come under fire. It has faced a lot of criticism here of late. The first question to you again, Kathy, what do you think the King County Regional Homelessness Authority has gotten right? And what do you think still needs addressing? So I think the one thing that they did get right, and I think most people would agree, is that during COVID, they were very efficient at getting COVID monies out to people and make in, in the form of rental assistance. And they were very effective in helping people uh, stay housed and not become homeless. And that is critically important. It is easier, more important, not more important, it's easier to keep people housed than it is to try to rehouse people. What they have not done right is made a lot of obstacles to getting into shelter uh, and a lot of mismanagement. Okay, Christiana, the same question. What has the King County Regional Homelessness Authority gotten right and what still needs to be corrected? I think that the approaches and some of the pilots that they've had has definitely shown a promising success. They've also started an amazing database where they're starting to really see who is in need and how you can connect them with housing that makes sense, which as someone who was in the beginning of King, uh, the um, coordinated entry, that's a huge win. But we also have to remember this homelessness crisis didn't start um, in, in the last, last two years. KCR, this, this uh, King County Regional Housing Authority 
has only been into existence for two years. So you're out of time. That's Sorry. time. Thank you. And that's going to lead us right into our next topic, which is affordable oh. housing. And you both cite affordability as one of your top issues here. So nearly two-thirds of the Seattle area's youngest renters, we're talking about Gen Z, spend at least 30% of their income on rent, according to the latest U.S. Census data. What would you do to make Seattle more affordable? Kathy, or, uh, Kathy let's go to you first. Um, well, we definitely need to build more housing. Um, we have a, a housing supply issue, and we certainly have a, an affordable housing supply issue. Um, unfortunately, it's going to take 40 years of pretty constant building to get to the point where we have naturally affordable housing. So we have to look at uh, how do we create affordable housing. I would go back and revisit the mandatory, and where we really need the housing is in the 50 to 80 percent uh, area of median income, that's workforce housing. Um, <clears throat> we need to go back and relook at the mandatory housing affordability ordinance and require that there be more on-site housing put in rather than in-lieu funding because there's a four to five year lag from the in-lieu funding uh, to actual putting uh, housing in place. We need to look at uh, extending uh, rental subsidies uh, through perhaps increasing the jumpstart tax and looking at uh, tax exemptions and expanding them out to property tax exemptions, expanding them out to 50 years rather than 12 for subsidized rent. Christiana. Yeah, so to continue with the statistics, right, that the average one-bedroom apartment in the city is about $1,600. Um, you would have to make about $70,000 a year to have the three times the income to even qualify for that. And most folks, when they're just coming out of college and their career, is not going to make that amount. Not to mention that the average, the average apartment in the city is like 500 square feet, and it's a studio or one bedroom. So what happens if you get married? What happens if you have a family, right? And so that really drives up the price. We really need to, I think the social housing PDA is going to really perhaps help because that's going to be based on income in a way that otherwise was restricted based on HUD or federal uh, guidelines that makes it lower. But especially if we're talking in the 70,000 range and, and higher when you have a family, even if you are making area median income, uh, the, the housing right now is, is, is really terrible. And so I think that we need to look at what's going on with the prices um, and make sure that we are able to have a market that's affordable. Well, Christiana, you talk about affordability and what it would cost to rent an apartment. Would you lobby the state to legalize rent control? And if that happened, what kind of policies would you put into place? I would, I would definitely think that we need to do something. So I, I wouldn't say it would only be rent control or rent stabilization, perhaps, but I definitely would say we have to do something. Um, one of the first things that we would do is that, you know, we've been hearing about how the larger property management companies are using sort of this internal service where they might sort of be price gouging and, and driving up that cost. Really looking into that, because if that is happening, we need to break that. Um, you know, sort of essentially antitrust it. So we can see if that can bring down the rents as well. All right, Kathy, same question. Uh, would I lobby for the, the city? Do you, yes. Would, do you support rent control and would you lobby the state for such a measure? No, oh, no, I do not support rent control. I think it's uh, been shown, if you just look at San Francisco and New York City where they both uh, have rent control, it has not resolved the issue of, of skyrocketing rents. Um, I think that what we do need to do, though, is we, ha we have put in, some, in place um, some tenant protections that have been very important in terms of giving tenants uh, a, a long period of notice when rent is going up, in terms of providing relocation assistance. The city needs to do a better job of connecting landlords to tenants in that instance. Um, and we also need to look at working with small landlords. Um, All right. And that's tough. <laughs> All right. Well, when we talk about affordable housing, the question is, where would it go? And we, uh, here in District 5, there's always the big question right now about the Jackson Park Golf Course. Should that be turned into a green space, or should that be made available for further housing development? Christiana, I pose the question to you first. Sure. I think that the, the biggest conflict I'm hearing about Jackson Park is that it feels inaccessible to people. 
um, and that we don't have a lot of land. Um, that's really the biggest scarcity area that we don't have is land, right? And so uh, speaking with Jackson Park for All, that's sort of their, um, their idea is like, well, here's this big swath of land that we can't really access. Is it a park? And, and if so, we should access it. If it's not, what would it look like to be able to have that, perhaps have eco-villages or other sorts of green ho homes? So you support green space rather than housing development? You can have both. You can have this. You don't have to have one or the other. Okay. Yeah. Kathy, I pose the question to you. Right. So at the moment, housing, uh, uh, and a, a voter initiative was passed, I believe it's Initiative 42, that prohibits housing being built there. Uh, it ha can only be park. If you use it for a different use, it has to be the equal use. So basically, it's golf. It has to be golf or it has to be park. So right now, that would require. Uh, a voter initiative or a lawsuit, and I don't think and that And right that's... now, one is on the table that right. is being proposed. Um, well, we would have to see what happens, but at the moment, I'm, uh, it's illegal at the moment. So uh, housing is not an option at this time. I do have a follow-up. Christiana, this is one of three city-run golf courses uh, that we have, and it also is pretty much packed uh, every day of the week, at least in the spring, summer, and fall, bringing in millions of dollars in revenue. So how do you make up that money if you turn it into green space? My understanding is, you know, I think that for golf, it's, it's a sport. I know that some of the high schools go and play there. I, it, it's not that the entire golf course would go away, but again, we have a crisis um, for housing, for housing that's actually in green spaces, because just because we have uh, affordable housing, folks want to live in green spaces too. They don't always want to live in concrete, right? And so I think it's really important um, that we uh, actually see how revenue neutral it is um, and, and go from there. Okay, we want to turn to uh, transit and infrastructure, obviously a big issue in our area as well, and Jake has more on that. Yeah, and Northgate Station is poised to be one of the busiest transportation hubs and corridors when it's all complete. Kathy, you live near Northgate. Currently, Council District 5 Council Member Deborah Wara says she's proud of her work to reimagine Northgate with the crack and ice plex and the John Lewis Memorial Bridge connecting both sides of I-5. But we've seen at these transit stations a real problem with crime and violence. Kathy, we'll start with you on this question about Northgate. How can you make that area more appealing for everyone, specifically the transit station? Oh, well, I think that we, obviously we need to have, it keeps coming back to, we need to have more police officers, but I also think that if we had community service officers who that was their particular precinct in which they could be in the neighborhood, um, we could have, uh, you know, community ambassadors that would be there. Uh, to greet people, talk to people, really just c create a sense that somebody is paying attention. Um, it will be nice when we actually have the development of where the Kraken is, some of that development opens, and so we are bringing more people to the transit station and to the area, um, so there's more activity um, and things to do, which I think help people feel, uh, helps uh, deal with crime and makes people want to be in that space. Christiana, same question for you about Northgate and the future. Yeah, so up until last year, I lived pretty much along Roar Avenue from Licton Springs up to 145th. And the biggest thing that I think is happening with the increase of crime is the crime is not necessarily increasing. That's always been an area where folks were unhoused or there was always, you know, something sort of going on. And so what may be happening is that the, you know, sort of that got disrupted. And, and instead of saying, hey, how can we use this opportunity to provide uh, services to have the transfer, you know, to have new organizations show up at that transit center? We just sort of built it. Um, and so I would love to see, especially a mixed use development um, in that space um, and have housing, have services, have resources where there's a third place, not just for, you know, for everyone, all of our neighbors to go. And that can not only be a place for folks to be able to get the help that they need and to be able to get off of the street, but also for us all to, to get to know each other and to build a community again. The Sound Transit and Metro both have budget shortfalls. They're finding it difficult to fully staff what they need when it comes to security. As a city council member, would you be able to implement any change or anything to add to the security measures at the Sound Transit? Yeah, I think that, that, again, it goes back to we, the, the real upstream issue here is the fact that there are so many different industries 
so many different areas where folks are underpaid and they are asking for increases. Um, and they're all the, the, the jobs that we really need, social workers, secure, you know, uh, bus drivers, things like that. So what I would do to make sure that we have the security, to have the services, is to make sure that we really are investing in those uh, core root solutions to, to have uh, wage parity. All right, let's get into the city budget. We mentioned that there could be as much as a $200, $250 million deficit by 2025. So Angela is going to give you a couple of questions about that. Yeah, and we could be looking at another $207 million deficit come 2026. So the problem seems to be compiling upon itself. A recent report from the Revenue Stabilization Work Group says Seattle is outpacing tax revenues. So how does the city balance the budget while also maintaining essential services? Or another way to pose that question is what is... Can you give us an example of where the city right now could better manage spending? Kathy, I'm going to start with you on this question. Um, better management. Well, I think that we do have a lot of duplicative services. Uh, we have a lot of outreach that's being done. Uh, we have a lot of different nonprofits that the city is funding through contracts. Um, and that I think are, many of them are doing the same job and it would be nice if we could get them to collaborate and consolidate. But I think that what we really need to do first thing, the ne next council, is to have a, a, a forensic audit uh, as well as a performance audit so that we actually know where all the money is being spent, uh, what are, where it is in the departments, and the next council is operating from the same set of facts uh, in the same base baseline. And then at that point, we are going to actually be able to answer that question. Where are we overspending? Where can we find efficiencies without necessarily having to lay people off, but be become more efficient and more lean like King County does? Can you give us an example where these services or organizations, um, processes are repetitive? No, truthfully, I can't. Um, I, don't, I don't know the details enough. I have a lot of assumptions, and I don't think it's, it's good policy to operate from assumptions, and that's why I think it's important to have the forensic uh, audit done, to, to be smart uh, and fair about what's being pursued. All right, Christiana, can you give us an example of where you think the city could better budget its funding? Sure. So as you know, I always joke and say I'm a wonk, right? And so I just got done reading this some 90-page budget proposal that was put for fire mayor and previous ones at that. It's really um, concerning that around a third of the SPD's budget is in overtime. Um, that goes uh, to show again that they are overworked. And really, if we're sitting here, we've talked this entire time about that we don't have enough housing, we don't have enough services, we have folks on the street. The last thing we need to do is to reduce social services. As a matter of fact, I think that there could be a both and a win-win here if we try to make sure that the police are, are, are well and that they're able to really focus on those priority one calls and to see if there's any sort of like based on the services that perhaps we would transfer that purview to folks already doing that work, see what the average cost of that is um, and see if that can help with seed funding as well as um, making sure that we pass something like a capital gains tax. Well, you bring up taxes. It sounds yeah. like you would support something like that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the something that I think is really important is that we have the most regressive tax system in the city, and we, uh, I mean, in the state, and the, the most regressive tax system in the country. Um, and so some of those uh, suggestions from the Re uh, uh, Revenue Stabilization Task Force we need to really have a council that's going to go and lobby around the equal taxation clause in our constitution because we won't be able to even put um, a tax uh, a tax brackets like we do for our federal taxes in place with that. And if we don't have progressive taxation, we're always going to be behind on revenue. Thank you. Kathy, do you support raising taxes or implementing new ones to address the city's current budget crisis? All right, so again, as I said, I think the very first step is to do a forensic audit as well as a performance audit. Um, I think that it, it really comes down to three things. We need to look at where we can be more efficient. We need to look at how we can expand our tax base. And then we also need to look at how we can generate additional revenue. Those two other steps happen after we have a very clear picture about where we're at, where the spending is happening. 
Honestly, I don't think we are necessarily going to get there just by tightening our belt. I do think we are going to have to look at progressive revenues. Okay, in terms of possible revenue sources, Kathy, and I know you say you're not completely decided on whether new taxes should be introduced or not, but would you support a tax on high earners, a CEO high pay ratio tax? Uh, yes, I, I think based on what I know at this point, I would, and it would be easily uh, incorporated into the Jumpstart tax. How about a tax on vacant property? Potentially. Uh, the concern I have with that is that there are smaller uh, landowners who have kept their property vacant uh, because of uh, unfavorable laws, and we don't necessarily want to um, um, have the unintended consequence of hurting small um, homeowner, or excuse me, small landowners, uh, larger vacant properties, absolutely. All right, I'm going to hand it back over to John. Okay, and we're actually almost out of time. We've made it. Uh, thanks for discussing these important topics, both of you. We're, we're, again, we're almost out of time, but before we go, we got our lightning round, our very exciting lightning round to bring to you. So these are just yes or no questions. I see you have the paddles in your hand. Uh, one is a green thumbs up, the other is an orange thumbs down. And these are, again, yes or no questions. Two minutes on the clock and we go. Angela first. Would you support a congestion pricing measure to reduce traffic and air pollution? Do you support redirecting funds from the police budget to social services and community programs? Would you support a pilot program to implement a universal basic income measure similar to what Tacoma tried? Deborah Ward has admitted she was surprised as some of the aspects of the job when she was elected. Do you think you'll understand the job? And if you could also say yes or no as well. Oh, yes. Sorry, we didn't make that clear, so, so not your fault at all. Do you think your policies would, for the most part, align with Mayor Harrell? Do you support rent control in Seattle? And again, say yes or no? Yes. Yeah. Oh, no. If we see another surge in COVID cases, are you in favor of lockdowns or mask mandates and or mask mandates? Yes to both. Is Seattle coming back? I think so, yeah. Speaking of coming back, should the Sonics and the NBA <laughs> return to Seattle? <laughs> yes. Why are you doing that? <laughs> gotta, th gotta throw the Sonics question in, sorry. Exactly. Should District 5 get another dog park? Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, dog lovers there. Park, we love it. Will the Mariners win the World Series by 2030? Yes. I hope <laughs> Very optimistic. <laughs> All right, the last one. The Golden Retriever is Seattle's most popular dog, but is it the best breed? I have a Yorkie. I can't say that. So. <laughs> it's actually a trick question because all breeds are the best and all dogs are the best. Yes, so, no. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. All right, we're going to give you both 60 seconds now for closing <laughs> statements. And, uh, Christiana, let's have you go first. You know, I, I decided to run, like I said, because there are so many people who I've worked with that um, called me up between Glenna's eating holiday and the beginning of the year uh, when uh, the, the, the current council members said they weren't going to run and asked me to. And why? Because I do have that track record of success. I do have the, um, the community supports, the people who have endorsed me. I've already worked with them to pass policies. Uh, and the, the toolkit that I've built and bring, I've used in other municipalities across the country. I know and I am confident that I can not only bring uh, that toolkit to bring change, to bring progress, to bring us together, but also hopefully so that we can build a community. Not just in District 5, but I've been here for 13 years now and it's home. And I really want to be able to have a space that has third places, transit, housing, where we all can be uh, in sort of a, have those multiple pathways towards shared goals. So thank you, and I, 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 I humbly ask for your vote. And Kathy? Well, thank you all very much for the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, I got into this race because I have lived in Seattle on and off since I was four years old. I have raised with my husband three 
sons here who all went to Seattle Public Schools. I want them to be proud of the city. I want them to be able to live in the city. I have a deeply personal commitment to this city being the best that it can be, being thriving, healthy, and equitable. I have spent the past 30 years of my life devoted to public service. I have served as a public defender. I have served as chair of the Seattle, Seattle Human Rights Commission. I served as the interim Seattle city clerk. And most recently, I served as a King County Superior Court judge. In all of those roles, I dealt with complicated issues. I had to make tough decisions that affected the daily lives of individuals. This is a very complicated job. We need somebody that can hit the ground running, somebody that has a track record of collaborative, established relationships. I think if you look at my endorsements, it's very clear that all of those uh, respected leadership believe that I'm the person to do the job, and I would be honored to have your vote. Thank you very much. Thanks to both of you for... Oh, sorry about that. Thank you both of you for joining us tonight. And a reminder to the folks in the audience and the folks at home, democracy doesn't happen without you and your vote. And, and um, speaking of voting, we are now, what, just about 20 some November odd days right. away seven. from November 7th. So there is still time uh, when you get your ballot, make sure it is postmarked by Tuesday, November the 7th, or make sure it's in a drop box by 8 p.m. that night. And if you're not registered yet or need more information as to how to update your ballot information, not too late, just go to votewa.gov for more information. Again, thank you to our candidates here tonight. And I think, Jake, it's your time to cue the moment that everyone's been waiting for. The moment tonight. we've all been waiting for. Let's give it up for our two candidates this evening, Christiana Obey Sumner and Kathy Moore. Thanks to the two of you for being here and giving us some insight into where you stand on the issues. And thank you all so much at home for watching and participating in the uh, uh, program here tonight. We want to thank you all. And from North Seattle College, have a good evening. And there it is, the fourth and final debate for Seattle City Council. District 5 candidates Christiana Obi Sumner and Kathy Moore squared off to see who is a better candidate to lead the district in Seattle's north end. That is the seat being vacated by Seattle City Council member Deborah Juarez. They touched on homelessness, crime, policing, affordable housing, and even taxes. Candidates for districts 1, 3, and 4 also had debates over the last two weeks. If you missed any of those debates, you can find the full debates on our Connected TV app, along with political roundtables, answering some of the biggest questions about the upcoming election in just a couple of weeks from now. Fox local app is free to download on Fire TV, Apple TV, Android TV, or Roku. Thank you again so much for joining us. Have a good night, and don't forget to vote on November the 7th. For more details on how to register to vote, make sure you visit our website at, at fox13seattle.com. We'll see you back here in one hour for Fox 13 News at 9. Until then, have a good night.